and uh, we're glad that you're here. Um, so today again, I have uh, Donna and Joellen and Alice, and we're ready to start our study in the letter of Second John. So the letter of Second John is uh, how many chapters? Just one, right? So uh, it's, it's a book of the Bible. That's There's several books of the Bible that are just one chapter, and uh, this is just one chapter. So we're going to try to get through this one chapter. It shouldn't be that hard. In fact, we might be up uh, a little bit less time than normal, um, but it was too long to do uh, Third John, which is also one chapter. So why don't we open with a, a word of prayer, and then we'll go ahead and get started. So let's, uh, let's pray together. Gracious God, we again thank you for this uh, beautiful August 4th day that you have given to us, Lord. It's hard to believe that uh, 4th of July was a month ago and we're uh, getting towards uh, the latter part of summer. And uh, we know that our children and uh, high school young people or college young people are going back to school soon, Lord. And uh, we pray that you would be with them, Lord. And uh, we Hope that you would join us uh, today as we uh, study your word, and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, so we're ready to start uh, in the letter of 2 John, and um, 2 John is uh, a personal letter that is written by John to one of his churches. Remember that uh, these churches, when we think of church in our time, what do we think of? When we say we're going to go to church what does that mean building. we're going to come to like a building like this right with the sanctuary over there and rooms like this and offices and classrooms and fellowship halls but in the first century um they that was not what church was they didn't have church buildings they came much later so where did people meet at in their homes, right? Most of the, they were just gatherings in, they were home churches. Uh, there weren't any, you know, church buildings uh, like we, we have uh, today. So um, John had, uh, was a pastor uh, in one, as many different titles, of course, disciple and apostle. Um, and he would write letters or travel. We're not sure how many of these house churches he had. Um, but he, I think, seems to have more than one of them. Uh, and a lot of the uh, writers of the New Testament letters, you know, had these house churches. And the same with Paul. They traveled around and wrote letters. Remember back then there was, you know, how did you get the word out? It was through um, word of mouth or letters. So all the letters that we read as part of the New Testament, they were written uh, to give care or advice to these churches that John and Paul and Peter were pastoring. Mm -hmm. um, so, and it's interesting that they almost always were written to address some kind of problem, right? And, and we looked at the letter of 1 John and the problem there was these antichrists who were telling people that Jesus did not you know, come in the flesh, that he was just a spirit. And so he was addressing that that problem. Um, and he also, another theme of 1 John was a lot of talk about truth and in particular also love. You know, to, if you love God, you're going to follow his commands. And his commands, the main commands are to, uh, to love others and to love God. He says it's not too hard. Remember that in Matthew 5, um, the Sermon on the Mount tells us that we are to um, be perfect in our love. You know, be we're not called to be perfect, but we are to be uh, follow God's teaching and command that we are to love God and to love one another. So that's a, a very consistent uh, uh, idea in John. I think also that we're going to see is that sometimes we hear, well, it doesn't matter what you believe. But here it does matter, right? Doctrine does matter. It, it matters whether Jesus came in the flesh or not. Because if he didn't, if the, meaning that if he did not come in the flesh, what does that mean? He wasn't what? You got it. You, you had it right there on the tip of your tongue. 
he wasn't human, right? Mm -hmm. If he wasn't born in the flesh, means that he wasn't human. And if he wasn't human, that means he couldn't have died. He couldn't have gone to the cross. Um, to, he couldn't have saved us from our sins if, if he was not human. So that's a very doctrinal position of Orthodox Christianity is that, that Jesus is 100% God and also 100% human. And the early church struggled with this idea. How, you know, how does that all work together? And it's not something that, you know, we say, well, you know, 100% and 100% doesn't add up right, right? Because it would be like 50-50. But the, it, it's like you can't overemphasize um, or overanalyze the logic there because it's not about logic, it's about faith. What it's really trying to say is that, that Jesus Christ was all God. He's part of the Trinity, part of the Godhead. He is all God. But he's also all human too, right? So he, you know, he came, he lived a life, he, he, he slept. You know, think about it. God does not need to sleep or eat, right? But Jesus slept and ate as part of his human and, and felt pain and everything else every human does. So he was all human and he was also all, all God. So that's the back, uh, the back story here. So let's go ahead and uh, we'll start working our way through it. It's a short, short letter and pretty easy to get through. So it begins, he begins by saying, we'll look at the first three verses, the elder. So let's stop there, very first word. Who is the elder? The elder is John referring to whom, do you think? The church. It, well, himself, oh, right? Okay. So he would be the elder. In fact, I can't remember off the top of my head, but in the book of Revelation, there's talks about the the, the twenty four uh, surrounding the, the lamb the uh, the throne of God where the lamb sits and there were the twelve patriarchs of the Old Testament the twenty four elders and then you had the twelve apostles of the New Testament it talks about the twenty four and you think about that um, that's a good balance between God's people the Old Testament and the New Testament because when you have what the twelve sons of Israel. And that does break down because you have the Levites who become the priestly tribe. Then Joseph, you don't have a tribe called Joseph because he has two sons. He gets like a double portion. So you lose one and then you pick up two. And so I'm just being very generic here. You have the 12 sons of Israel uh, and then you have the 12 disciples apostles. So they would represent uh, and then you have the Judas issue, but he was replaced. So, but they what that means that the twenty four representing the the patriarchs of the Old Testament and the apostles of the the New Testament. So John would be one of those elders, right? John the apostle, John the disciple. So he would be, uh, and notwithstanding what the um, uh, Da Vinci Code books and movies say, mm -hmm. and the la the picture of the Last Supper that is not Mary Magdalene, that is the Apostle John, who sits, was it to the immediate right of um, yeah. of, of uh, looking at that picture of Jesus? So, so yes, he was one of the apostles. Uh, and uh, one other thing I wanted to share about the letters of the New Testament: they were written all in a very short period of time. When you think about the New Testament, they were written after Jesus died, say around 40 A.D., and they were all completed by you know no later than. 100 AD at the most. So we were talking about the whole New Testament was written in, you know, around 50 to 70 years, something like that. While the Old Testament spanned thousands of years. So that's a bit, so all these letters that, that come out in the New Testament are, um, are coming pretty quickly, right? And the context is that these new fledgling churches are dealing with all kinds of problems. And, you know, First Corinthians, remember they were eating the food before other people arrived and, you know, different. So they're dealing with all these problems. And, and so you have John and Peter and Paul, and then there are some, we don't know the author like Hebrews, they're essentially writing letters to guide people and straighten things out. So we have the elder John. It says, to the lady chosen by God 
and to her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all who know the truth. So who would the, the lady here, who do you think that would be? Well, yeah, it's a church, right? You know, think about, do they still call hurricanes by feminine names still, or did they change? Like, yeah, they do. They used to do, and, and I, I'm just trying to think of an example. I mean, ships they used to give feminine names to. So church, scripturally, church is always referred to in female terms, or, or the people of God in general. Even in the Old Testament, when God talked about his people worshiping idols, he he considered that adult a, a spiritual um, adultery where people were cheating on him, like they're chasing other gods or cheating on him. So there's that whole marriage context of both the Old and the New Testament. In the New Testament, you have the language of Jesus Christ is the uh, bridegroom and the church is the bride. Mm -hmm. And so the lady would be referring to uh, this church. And he says, I, I and her children. So, you know, some of this, you, it's kind of, you think about it and you have some background, it's not real hard to work through. So um, the children would be the individual members, right? That would be the children of this church. Uh, probably not a very big church or anything. So here it says, I, I love the truth. So here, truth, there is truth, right? And truth is not subjective, but it's objective. Jesus said, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, remember Pontius Pilate asked Jesus, what is truth? There is truth, and Jesus is truth. And he says, because of the truth which lives in us, so, you know, think about the truth. We can think of truth living in us, but if Jesus is the truth, and the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are of the same, you know, substance, and the Holy Spirit lives in us as us being the temple of the Holy Spirit, that means that truth should live in us. That's I think that is a... a, a a crucial element of who we are as believers. Like we should always be about the truth, right? Uh, saying the tr truth with love. That doesn't mean using ways to hurt people, but we should always be about what the truth is because that's what Jesus is all about. And that's what he is. So he, he says, because of the truth, which lives in us and will be with us forever. So put this in the context of people who were trying to teach the false teachers who were saying that Jesus wasn't um, didn't come in the flesh, that he, he wasn't born. Now that may seem like, you know, if you're talking to someone, that may seem like a minor issue, like for unreligious or unfaith people, because when you think about it, what's as long as you do good, what's the difference if Jesus was spirit or if he was, whether he, what's the difference if he came in the flesh or not? What's the difference? Well, it, it, it is a big deal, right? There's a big difference because if Jesus was not born in the flesh, that means that he, he was not human. If he's not human, we can't have any sort of salvation through him. And he's just like God. I, I know that um, a, a lot of Muslims in particular have one of their issues with the Christian faith. They think that we worship three gods. So we're poly, polytheistic. That's the way... Like, you know, I actually was online talking to a Muslim and I said, uh, I said, you know, it's no, there is one God that reveals God's self in three ways, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? There's three persons, but it, it's a, it's a hard concept, but there, we only believe in one God. There's not three gods. Like, it's the same God. It's of the, uh, of the same uh, substance. So uh, so then he goes on with the title in verse number three. It says, grace, um, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son will be with us in truth in love. So 2 John is this uh, personal letter written by John. Um, he uses the term idol, which is his title of authority. Uh, the use of lady refers to the feminine terms used for the church. In verse number four, he said, it has given me great joy to find, this is, I think, key here, some of your children walking in the truth, just as the Father commanded us. So um, very similar to 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, here is the, uh, well, let me back up a little bit. John writes to give confidence and encouragement to those who have not left and followed 
these false teachings of the Gnostics. Because what's he saying here? Does he say um, it's a great joy to find that all your children walking in the truth? Some. No, the key word there is some. Mm -hmm. So people are listening to false teachings and following for it. Is that any different than what happens today? No. no. People find, find uh, you know, and follow all kinds of false teachings. Mm -hmm. And they are swayed by them. So, so here you have John. Think about it. What better pastor you could have? Like, well, you, you're stuck with me as pastor, you know. But think about it. You have the Apostle John as your mm -hmm. pastor, right? And he still wasn't like, getting through to everybody. Like, because he says, well, he's, he's thankful, like, like, well, some of you are still hanging around with what I'm teaching here, and I'm and I'm grateful for that, uh, that you're still walking in the truth. And I think it's important to note here also that the term walking, it, it implies what? There's there's like movement, right? You're we don't stand still in the truth, but we we walk in the truth. It, it's something that is an active uh verb isn't it we're we're walking in the truth just as the father commanded us um so he let's look at uh verses five and six he says and now dear lady again he's you know he's writing this to uh, one of his churches we're not really sure how many churches he had whether it was you know one two three um but he's writing to this church and he he's saying that's a dear lady to the church you know, I am not writing you a new command, but one that we have had from the beginning. I ask that we love one another. Um, and this is love that we walk, there's that word again, that we walk in obedience to his commands, as you have heard from the beginning. His command is that you walk in love. So it's it's sort of like like preaching. I always feel like when I preach, I've already said this a lot, but it doesn't matter. Like you have to, like John keeps saying the same thing over and over again. Um, I guess we have to constantly be reminded of, like look how many times Kathy tells me how to turn this uh, <laughs> camera and the iPad and, and line it all up so that we're recording, you know, and every week I get stuck at some point. One, so, one thing that I've learned, through Bible studies and reading the scripture is that if it's important, it will be repeated. So here we go. Right. Yeah, Alex just made a good point that if go. it's important, it'll be repeated. That That is a very valid point because I look at sometimes scripture says things. It's telling, like, to understand the word of God, it's not like we take out any verse and we, we do it because there's verses that say, we should bash, I'm paraphrasing, bashing our enemies' babies' heads against a rock, one of the Psalms. Do we do that? No, of course not. But you have to take everything in context. And, and there's something called systematic theology. It's like how you fit everything together. Uh, you know, it's, for example, when, when we look at the whole, like you don't pull things out of the New Testament, say for uh, any part of the Bible, Old or New Testament. For example, I talked last week about um, Jacob going to find his his wives, you know, and how really dysfunctional Abra the the extended family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were, you know, and God picked them to be his people. Does that mean that we lift that up as a value? I don't think because we we from the time of Genesis three have living live in a fallen world. So just because those things happen, it, it's telling like. The story, it's like reading a book, like you're getting the whole picture. It's not like you pull out one sentence and say, that's what we have to do. Now, there are there are verses and sentences in the Bible that encapsulate a lot of good things, like John 3.16 is a good, you know, a paramount example. Um, but you have to look at how all the pieces fit together and how you interpret them together. So you can't say that, oh, you know, like I've heard like God will approve of homosexual marriages because look at what David did or look at what, um, you know, uh, Jacob did. He had two wives and two concubines and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But God wasn't stamping that with his approval. 
you know, um, I believe that in the area of marriage, and, and marriage is not just about love, our personal love. It's it's about a whole theology, right? Because the whole context in the in the Bible, God was married he's to his people, right? And Jesus is the bridegroom of the bride. So it, 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 there's like a spiritual application. When you go into Hosea, it talks about because the people were cheating on God, Hosea had to marry um, a harlot. <laughs> Thank you, Hosea. You know, uh, uh, whatever, a prostitute, whatever, to kind of like he had to live out what God was experiencing um, at a spiritual level. Because God considers himself in a marriage with us. I don't know if we ever think about that, but we're like married to God. I think that's why the Catholic Church, for example, I mean, has the idea of uh, like the priesthood. Like the priest never got married, even in the Old Testament. Why? Because the priest was married to God. That was That's the, kind of like the teaching behind it. Um, so... So, so yeah, that's a, it's a, a lot there. So what I'm saying in general is like we can never look at something in the Bible and just because it's in the Bible doesn't mean that we should do it. Like, for example, it's like taking, uh, you know, Cain killed Abel. Well, Cain killed Abel in the Bible, so therefore we can go kill our brother, right? It's not saying that. You have to look at the whole context and the whole story uh, to make sense of it. I also believe that no matter where we are, as I talked about last week, we are called to be uh, witnesses, not judges. Like, like I, I think that our, our pilgrim's progress or our spiritual journey is to focus on ourselves. Like I can't, like all I can do is the only person that can grow spiritually that I can control is which person? Don Kephart. Right? That's it. I can help you, share with you, pray with you, preach to you, teach, all those sorts of things. But ultimately, you have to decide your spiritual growth. I, I can't, I can be a witness. And then how you grow or don't grow in what areas, I can't, it's not my place to like judge that, you know, it's, I can just be a witness. Uh, and that's what we're, we're called to be. So in verse five, so, so in verses five and six here, very similar to 1 John 1 and 7, the command is to love one another. Love always means to be obedient to Christ's commands. And remember, we looked at that So, in the letter of 1 John. So, so to love is to be obedient to Christ's commands. And we talked about previously how being um, obedient to the commands of Christ, um, how we... How does that happen? There's, there's two ways to get someone to follow your commands. You can do it by sort of a punitive punishment, um, you know, using intimidation force, or you can follow some commands out of love. Like you're going to do what we do, what God asks us to do, not because we fear him, um, but I know the Bible in places says to fear God. That that's not. It's a different meaning of fear. It's more like respect. Um, so we don't we don't we're not afraid of God. Like that's why I think it's so bad theology to say that if we we should be afraid of God. Like we should be afraid of going to hell. You know, we're He's going to send us to hell, whatever like that. Um, that's not what's happening. It's basically when you think about it. Hell is just not having a relationship with God. That, that's the way I understand it. I don't think God takes people and throws them into the fire sort of thing. It's a, a spiritual reality. Because when you think of uh, reality, there's two, there's, there's two realities. There's, there's physical reality, which is, of course, real. If I say, this is a pen here, that's a, that's a physical reality. We're all sitting at this table, that's a physical reality. There's also spiritual reality. And so sometimes folks think that, well, if you say something's a spiritual reality, it's not really real. Does that make sense? Because it's spiritual. Um, but spiritual reality is just as real as physical reality. Okay, you look a little bit. So now think about like when we celebrate communion, for example, we believe 
that God, the Holy Spirit, is with us, right? But unlike, say, the Roman Catholic Church that believes that elements turn into the real physical body and blood of Jesus, we don't believe that, right? But we do believe that he is there in a spiritual way. And a spiritual way is just as real as a physical way. Does that, mean, does that help a little bit? So it's, re, it's like two realities. They're both realities, but it's a different kind of reality. So One is tangible and the other not. Yeah, one is tangible and one is not. I mean, things that we can touch, see. Um, so when it comes to, if we don't have a relationship with God through Christ and we say, we, what is hell? Hell is not having a relationship with God which we are meant to be so it's a it's it's a place of a spiritual place of pain right it's it's like you're not having a relationship with your creator so we are meant to have that relationship so if we if we're not having it we're going to be we're going to be suffering so you look at the scriptural scripture how it talks about hell it talks about it as you know a place in the deep uh, and actually it refers to a burning garbage pit outside Jerusalem, you know, and that we talked to, that never goes out. And so that is what hell or an outer darkness. So what, what the scripture writers are trying to say is this is what it's like to not be in relationship with God. So God wants us to be in re relationship with God, but he doesn't force us. He doesn't compel it, compel us. He doesn't send people to hell. It's a choice that we make not to be in relationship uh, with him. Uh, it's a, so it's a spiritual. I don't like, for example, if you try to drill down to the center of the earth, are you going to, like, say we could scientifically do that. Are we going to find, okay, we found, the, you know, we found hell. Here it is right here. You know, here's all the people who went to hell. It, you're, we're not going to find it there. It's just not being in a relationship with him. So, so the command to love one another and to be obedient to Christ's command as an act of love reflect um, the situation in John's churches. So how does this command to one to love one another and be obedient to Christ's commands as an act of love reflect the situation in John's churches? Well, it's because they are under attack from deceivers. And they are binding themselves to one another and to God's truth. So when we look at these two verses in verses five and six, it says, he says, Now, dear lady of the church, I'm not writing you a new command, but one we had from the beginning. I ask that we love one another. And this is love that we walk in obedience to his commands to love God, to love our neighbor. As you have heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love so this is sort of like circling the wagons i guess kind of like they're they're pulling together and they are under attack from deceivers and they are binding themselves to one another and to the word of god okay so here it is again this is probably like the fifth time this has come up in this letter uh in the letters of john It says, I say this because many deceivers. So how many deceivers are there? Many. No, it's not just one. So how many times do we hear a teaching that says, this is the Antichrist, right? So what does it say here? There's many, many. right? Many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh, that Jesus was not born. He was not human. He was just a spirit or something like that. They acknowledge, but here's the thing about bad teaching, unbiblical teaching. It always sounds good, right? Remember, the angel, uh, Satan is an angel of light. So, like, evil doesn't present itself as evil. Satan's not that dumb, right? It always presents itself as something that is alluring or beautiful or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. So don't expect sin. Don't expect the tactics of Satan to be um, 
like ugly and repulsive. It doesn't work that way. Anyone who's trying to trap anything knows that. If you're a trapper and you're trying to trap, uh, you know, uh, uh, I have a neighbor. We're, my my uh, yard, my neighbor's yard, or we're like overrun by chipmunks. Mm -hmm. And they're everywhere. He traps them and kills them. He puts out traps. I don't, I don't like to kill the thing. So, and then my cat catches a few too. So, but, um, but if you're trying to chap, uh, trap a chipmunk or whatever you're trying to trap, I don't know. Don't, what do you have to do to trap it? You have to put out bait, something that, that is, you know, something, you know, that is going to appeal to them. If you put, I don't know, dead weeds in the <laughs> trap, and you're going to attract, uh, attract anything to that trap? No. So like Satan works the same way. He doesn't try to trap us by things that are, you know, are um, appealing or beautiful. Uh, I mean, he does by ugly, you know, you know what I mean? So, um, so that's what's happening here. So the, so a lot of false teaching, it sounds beautiful. It sounds like, why can't everyone just love each other? We can coax. It doesn't matter what you believe that doctrine. It's not important to you. It doesn't really matter. What's the difference, right? It sounds very good. So the Gnostic unbelievers have left the church. And so where did the Gnostic unbelievers come from? I said they left the church. So where did they come from? They came from, they came from the church, right? They weren't outsiders. Like yeah. they were part of this. Yeah. And we'll see this when we get into the, part of the, church? Yeah. the third letter of John, right? So the, the Gnostic unbelievers have left the church and they've gone out into the world and they spread their unbelief. And there's great urgency in this letter about the Antichrist and the damage that they can do. So you know, again, this is a good verse. You see it through all these letters, but here's one in particular. It says, when you hear, um, I I think that right now there's a lot of bad teaching on all sides. I think the progressive things and the mainline denominations are off. I'm considering myself orthodox. On the other hand, I can't stand a lot of like the TV type preachers either. They're just like nuts. They're not biblical at all. And so that's why I get accused of being like people who call themselves conservative. They often follow like these nut jobs on TV. I'm serious. They just, you know, they they scare people. They talk about the Antichrist is coming or Obama's the Antichrist or this person, you know, or whoever, you know, and it's always changing and the world was going to end the second coming Christ when Israel was formed as a nation and in, in that generation. Well, it happened in the 1940s. Like we're way past one generation. And what happens when their prophecies don't fulfill, they just change them. Like they just update them. So a lot of people follow that and they call that conservative. And or but it's not, you know, and so you know, I, I just try to stick to what the Bible says, and here it's very clear. He says, John says, I said this, I, I say this because many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. Mm -hmm. Now there are other places in scripture it talks about, I think in Thessalonians, the man of lawlessness, but that's like a different context and a different situation. And what some of the TV preachers do and they talk about all the rapture stuff is they pull verses from here and from here and from here and they kind of put it all together to make their story. And you have to look at what the context is of the letter that you're part of the scripture that you're looking at. Um, so here, very clearly, when... The scripture's talking about Antichrist. It's it's like this, you don't have to be a great theologian to understand this, do you? I mean, he's saying that these are the Antichrist, the ones who deny that Jesus came in the flesh and have gone out into the world. Such a person is a deceiver and the Antichrist. Notice here, it's not capitalized, is it? It's not like the Antichrist. You're just one of the Antichrist. So any one of us could be the Antichrist, right? If we went out and said, you know what? If I got up on the pulpit on Sunday and said, you know, Jesus wasn't really born. Mm -hmm. um, he the, And you could justify there. You could find scripture to say that God is a spirit. Right. And he is. he is. He is a spirit. <laughs> but he loved us so much that he became human flesh for in, in the person of Jesus and was born 
That's what that's why we celebrate Christmas, right? Yeah. God who was spirit became encapsulated in human flesh uh, for us. So um, so if someone say that's not true, then you know God is the spirit. They could even say the Holy Spirit lives in you, and all that sounds really good. But as they deny Jesus coming in the flesh, that's not not biblical. So verse number eight. Uh, so let's go on here. So uh, so here's the warning. Watch out that you do not lose what we have worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. A clear warning to this church that John is writing to that they need to be on guard and diligent that they aren't led away from the truth. Because when we follow Jesus, there are rewards. And I have a number of scriptures that talk about rewards. And um, we don't have to look them all up but I'll mention them. Uh, Mark chapter 9, verse 41. Mark chapter 10, 29 to 30. Some of these are in parables. Luke chapter 19, verses 16 to 19. That's the parable of the minus, you know, that the one who invested got more reward. But I'm going to look up one. Here's one. I'll just look up one as an example. Uh, if I could find my way into Hebrews. James. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 26. I thought I marked this ahead, but apparently... Oh, yeah, I did mark it. Uh, Hebrews 11, verse number 26. Um, 24. It says, He regarded disgrace... He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. And this is referring to the faith of like Moses. It says when Moses, when he had grown up, he refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. Then he regarded the disgrace for the sake of Christ as greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. So Moses turned down all the earthly rewards that would have come through being a, a high official, you know, with uh, Pharaoh's government uh, and instead, you know, was advocating for God's people, the children of Israel. But there's a reward in that. So when we, when we follow the commands of God, um, the reward might not be immediate, but there will be a reward for doing what God asks us to do. And that's a, a not like Alice, you were saying a little bit before about how something, if there's a teaching, it usually gets repeated. Yeah. So that's one of those cases. When like we've, if we follow God and Jesus, uh, maybe we won't get an immediate reward. In fact, we may suffer because of it. But in if you play the long game, I have one of my friends who's a district superintendent and uh, he'll always tell me, he says, Don, play the long game, play the long game. And what that means is, you know, don't look for immediate results or rewards, but do what's right and you'll get the reward in the end. You know, I'm not necessarily talking about a physical reward, but it will work out better, right? That's a, a important, which I, by the way, has to do with one of the fruits of the spirit, which is forbearance or patience, mm -hmm. right? You know, have forbearance, have patience. So that's uh, any. Let me stop. Pause there. Any questions so far before we move on to uh, chapter? Excuse me, verse number nine. I had a question, and I guess I get it dealt with that verse you read from Hebrews. Um, the faith chapter that's in Hebrews 11. Yeah. Um, I guess Moses Moses spent most of his time as Pharaoh's daughter, a child, yeah. <laughs> being up, raised by Pharaoh's being daughter. Being raised by an Egyptian who right. was not knowledgeable in the ways of God. Where did he get his teachings? Where did he get his knowledge? Now, granted, his mother and father, we don't know about his father, but his mother was Hebrew. Mm -hmm. 
did he commune directly with God? Well, I, you know, I'd have to look in there a little further, but I would say that because he was Hebrew and like, and he would, he had a connection with his people, you know, his Hebrew people. He knew that he was Hebrew. Right. But he has, to me, he has more knowledge of God than some of the people did in the Old Testament. Yeah. So All right. I, the question yeah. is, or, uh, how did uh, Moses get his knowledge as who he was about God? Yeah. Um, he stu- he, you know, the word of God would have been there. He, you know, we don't know the backstory. He could have talked to his people. There would have been, uh, there would have been uh, leaders in the Israelite community who would know their story. That you know, he would have known of who Yahweh was yeah. through his his uh, people. So that's what I would, you know, say about. Off the subject. That's, that's all right. No problem with getting off the subject. Um, so let's uh, so let's look at verse. Uh, we're going to go back. Look at verse number nine here, and um, let me get back to this. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. So a warning to those who do what. Fall away. No, not fall away. It says they do something else. Oh. They run oh. ahead. Oh. Uh, they so what does that mean to run ahead? To chase after a new idea that sounds like good doctrine and truth, and to do so means to depart from the Father and the Son. So what's he thought? So he's talking about here. Remember those who some of his people. Uh, let's say getting back into ver- remember back to verse four it says, it says, giving me great me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth. So some of them are still walking in the truth with the Father and the Son, but what are the other ones doing? They are it's like a kid you're you know walking to the store and they what do they do? They run ahead. So they're running ahead, meaning that they are chasing after a new idea. So the new idea that they're departing from is this Gnostic teaching about Jesus not coming in the flesh. And so they're chasing after that idea, uh, even though it sounds like good doctrine and truth. And to do so, it means uh, they are departing from the Father and the Son. And I wonder if today, if we would take as serious the many false teachings that depart from God's word. Uh, what if someone said or taught that Jesus was a spirit and never came in the flesh. Uh, I, I, I mentioned that before, but I wonder just what if I, I preached that on Sunday? How many people would respond to that and in what way if I said that from the. Try it. I should try as a test. <laughs> oh, I wonder, I would, I would hope that people would challenge me, right? Yeah. Because that would be a false doctrine. How many people hear false doctrines and fall for it? Mm-hmm. If I would say, you know, God is spirit, He loves us. You know, I I can't, we shouldn't be singing these hymns about the blood of Jesus and all that kind of stuff. Uh, uh, You know, we shouldn't be talking about a fountain filled with blood. Um, And so, yeah, so that's what, you know, that's what's happening here. It says uh, it could sound like good doctrine, truth, but it's not. So how else do we run ahead? How do we run ahead and depart from uh, the truth about Jesus. And so something to think about. And there are probably a lot of different ways that that can happen. And so he, so those who were running ahead, so in verse 10, I'm looking at 10 and 11 together. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take them into your house or welcome them. That's pretty strong. Like, so, so there's like, a, you know, don't listen to it. Don't, um, don't, follow it and anyone who welcomes them shares in their wicked work so here he's talking about very particular this is the word of god right very particular about these gnostic teachers don't even like welcome them um so we are warned not to welcome false teachers or let them into the house so again think about teaching if someone's teaching something that's not correct um they should not be teaching. So there's right? people who are watching. But we should still pray for them. And yeah, it says, yeah, but you shouldn't let them teach. Right. You know, 
So you've got these these uh, TV evangelists that come into your home mm -hmm. and you welcome them, mm -hmm. right? And they're I'm, I maybe you encounter more of that in people in your Bible study, I guess. So yeah, you made a good point because I have my notes. Like, what about TV? Yeah, you know, we're welcoming or the internet or mm -hmm. you know, a few years ago, what if I was doing this study, I would say the radio and TV. Now it's the radio and the TV and the internet and social media, you know, Facebook, Twitter, all, you know, mm -hmm. the whole list of that. So there are multiple ways that we could uh, welcome false teaching into our houses. And again, you know, to be fair, um, you, I really have a problem like with John Hagee and, some of the you know some of these TV preachers that people fall all over you know, mm -hmm. and um, and they folks think they're orthodox and conservative and they're they're you know they're not they really have a like for one thing if you like if you look at prophecy in the Old Testament the the prophecies were for what was happening at that time you know and you know think of a good example I don't care whether you're talking about Jeremiah or Isaiah, you know, I, um, Ezekiel, um, um, whoever, the, the one who confronted the prophets of Baal, who was at um, Elijah, Elijah, and then the one who followed him, Elijah. Elijah, for example, who was he challenging? Ahab and Jezebel, right? That's who was he prophesying again. Or even use an example of, of Nathan and David. Nathan was correcting David. So the, the prophets were dealing with situations in their own time. And when they talked about evaders from the north, they weren't talking about the Soviet Union or Russia or China. They were talking about the, like the Babylonians or the Assyrians because all the invaders would come from the north, for example, because of the, you know, if you think of a map, I don't know how if you have a map in your head or not, but you have the Tigris, Euphrates, on the back, if you look in the back of most every Bible, you have the, like, how did people travel in ancient times? They traveled, they, you know, on animals or walked and they followed river valleys, right? Because that's where you would have food and water and so forth. You couldn't come across deserts. And in the Middle East, you have a, the Arabian Desert. So you would go up the Tigris, Euphrates, or river valleys and come down into the land of Canaan. If you follow the journey of Abraham, it went from, he went from Ur to Haran down to Canaan. He followed the river valleys. Um, so anyone who's coming, invading, traveling, what direction are they going to come in, in the Holy Land towards Israel? They're, they're, they're going to come from the north if they're Assyria, Babylon, or they're going to come from, if you're there, Egypt, they, of course, they would come from the north. But most invaders were coming from, excuse me, from the south. Egypt would be that only exception. Every other superpower who would attack Israel, whether you're talking about, you know, Assyria or the Babylonians or the Persians or even the Greeks, under Alexander the Great, they're going to come from the north because that's where they're from. So a lot of those things are really talking about things at their time. Now, what makes the Bible so um, relative to, to us is because there's a sense of things being timeless, like the same issues that were faced in the Bible are the same things that we face today. Because people are people, and that's, the, you know what I mean? We haven't really changed that much. So um, so we are, we are warned about not welcoming false teaching into our homes. By welcoming anyone who offers false teaching, we are sharing in what? That, the, that person's wicked work is what, uh, what is said here. So right now, I just want to do, where are we? Oh, I didn't think we'd get to near an hour, and here we are almost there. So... Um, I want to do some review at the end of, because uh, we're finishing up this one. So you could say I read the whole, you could read one, many Bible books or letters or just one chapter. You, you could read a whole chapter in five minutes. So how might we distinguish false teaching from variations in the true faith? Because I think that's what that's what's talking here a lot about, right? Don't let false teachers into your home, that kind of stuff. Don't let these antichrists teach. How might we do that? So here's a, a sort of orthodox list that I came up with. First of all, it has to do with the Trinity. That we believe that there are three persons, and I'm going to do this in a very summary way. 
you can ask any questions if you want to. There are three persons and one God, right? So we believe in the Trinity. We believe that Jesus came in the flesh. He was born. He was, another, another way of saying that is that he was human, right? Mm -hmm. So to say that um, Jesus was a spirit, an angel, that is a false teaching. He is a sinless human and one with God the Father. He lived as human, but he never committed any. And I could back, I'm not going to go every single scripture verse, but you can find that. It says that he was sinless human and that he was one and the same with his father. They were not any different. The third, and, and the Holy Spirit's part of that too. Also, the Holy Spirit is a person. Holy, uh, Holy Spirit is not an it. I often hear the Holy Spirit compared to like uh, the force. If you are ever watched Star Wars, you know, that you have the, the force be with you kind of thing. Um, he's not a force. Uh, he's not an it. The Holy Spirit is a person, right? Not like a person in the sense that like you or have a person doesn't necessarily have to have human flesh. Uh, it simply means that they are personified. They have a, a personality, right? So the Holy Spirit is a person. Satan is a personality, uh, again, a person, not a figure of evil. Like, I mean, Satan is Say that again. Satan is a personality, a person. He's he, he not a figure of evil. Like, you know, in other words, if you're going to believe what scriptural orthodoxy teaches, it says that Satan is an actual person. Like, not like, uh, like, I'm not saying human. When I say person, it doesn't have to mean human being. It means having an entity that has a personality. Like a good example of that, think about Jesus when he's baptized, he goes into the wilderness and he's tested by the devil. Does that seem to you like that's just um, um, some kind of uh, figure of evil? No, he, he he's like he's like a character, right? He's there, um, and there may be some disagree with that. But so this is my test. I mean, Satan is a personality, not just a figure. God works through the church, the body of Christ. And I have a note here, Ephesians chapter three, verse ten. So the church is the body of Christ. It's not just we're not like the Rotary, the Fire Hall, the Elks, or any other type of organization. That the church is the body of Christ. Satan, death, and evil were defeated by Christ at Calvary, at the cross. So Satan, death, and evil were defeated at the cross. Our salvation is grounded in the grace, meaning unmerited love and forgiveness of Jesus Christ, not our good works. There's nothing we can do to ever be good enough. Like, we're, yeah, we're supposed to be good, but that's more of a response to our salvation, not that we work to earn it. Um, our good works are a result of the work of the Holy Spirit within us. Anything good is from God. In fact, the word good means God. That's where you can hear the similarity. Um, mm -hmm. So any goodness is of God, even in uh, someone who doesn't know Jesus. There are, there are examples of people who were instruments of God who were not believers in God. So anything good is from God. Jesus Christ will come again and establish his reign on earth. Now, it's really clear. We could talk about, you know, end time stuff. And there's all kinds of theories about, you know, what I believe the scripture says is that Jesus will return again. It doesn't talk about tribulations and rapture. I mean, it does in certain places. Some of the problems I have with all this tribulation stuff you hear on TV is that, you um, there are many places in the world that right now, they're going through their tribulation right now. Like, you know, we're, we don't experience it that much. And this is throughout history. So, but we clearly see that Jesus is going to come again. I just don't think there's all this, this part goes up and wait, he's just, I think he's going to come, you know, and that's it. It's like, it's not that complicated. He's just going to come. Um, so uh, he will come again and establish his reign on earth. I said that one. Evil Satan and death will be totally destroyed, finalizing the victory of the cross. So um, the victory is won at the cross. We're just waiting for it to be finished off. There will be a total recreation, healing of God's created order. We see that 
in Revelation, we see that there is going to be a new heaven and a new earth. I mean, that is that is coming and a promise. The Holy Spirit is actively at work in the world today. The Holy Spirit hasn't gone into hiatus that the Holy Spirit continues. Otherwise, we can't be saved. The only reason we can come to Christ, or what John Wesley called justifying grace. Remember we, last week we talked about preventing grace, which meant the words change meanings. It meant pre prevenient grace. It means to proceed, not to stop. But he leads, the Holy Spirit leads us, and then we acknowledge Christ as Savior. Uh, that is a justifying grace. So um, the Holy Spirit is, the only one who can do that is the Holy Spirit. He is uh, actively at work. God's providence is at work always. Uh, providence simply means, I, mean, I know I'm going through this pretty fast, but God's providence is um, the opposite of coincidence. It's not like God is at work. He, he makes things work out as part of our faith, right? Um, that's why we, that's kind of a word you don't even hear that much anymore, but it simply means God is actively at work. And we are instruments of God's providence. We are involved in him working things for good. And God reveals himself uniquely in Christ. So that's like something that's he, that's a one-time unique experience. So to me, that's like a summary, a very fast, brief summary of what it means to really be a biblical Christian and, you know, anything that goes off in different directions and speculation. And, you know, I think that there are two different ways that comes under, like it's, it's coming from, I think false teaching is coming from two different directions. One of them is what I would consider theological progressivism that is basically saying the scripture is not authoritative. It's, you know, all, you know, love is love and all that kind of stuff. And now on the other hand, it's what I call, for lack of a better word, the TV preacher type stuff. Um, there's a lot of false teaching there too. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting, like when I think false teaching comes, it comes in different directions. The ultimate expression of universalism would be in what's called the, um, uh, the Unitarian Universal Church. You know, that's like, it doesn't matter what you believe. We're all, you know, many of them have even said, it doesn't matter if you even believe in God or not. We're just gathering together as a community of faith. So, you know, you have that, and then you have the other extreme, I guess. So 2 John is a follow-up reminder letter that follows what John wrote in 1 John. So let me just read the last uh, couple verses here. He says, so again, you can tell that this is, you know, when we look at scripture, we're looking at like real letters that were being written. Like they're, they, like we kind of think that scripture just came, fell out of heaven written like for us, but it, it is the word of God. It is, but it's, it's has a, a, a foundation or roots. And so these are like real people you know, real, real leaders or pastors like John writing to real people who were living in, in active in real churches and had their real problems. So he says, I have much to write to you, but I do not want to use paper and ink. Kind of sounds like something you could hear at one of our meetings. Like, yeah. well, do we really need to print all that, you know, <laughs> you know, waste all that paper and ink, you know? Instead, I hope to visit you and talk with you face to face so that our joy may be complete. So what is John saying here? He says, this is a letter, but uh, I'm coming in person. Remember, like this is the only way they communicate. You either wrote a letter and sent it off with some courier or you showed up in person. Um, the children of your sister who is chosen by God send their greetings. So a sister might be, who might be a sister here? If the lady is the church, what could a sister of the lady be? No, another church, right? A sister, right? If the lady's the church, yeah, the sister, yeah, another sister church. So, you know, we talk about connectionalism. They had their connections too because he's saying, you know, it's like, uh, you know, I'm talking to you. And by the way, I was talking to someone at, you know, Ann Ashley Church and they said to say hello to you, right? So the children of your sister who was chosen by God, they are sending their greetings also. 
So that wraps up our uh, second joint. I know we went off into some other things, but I think it's all connected. And so next week we'll meet on Wednesday. Uh, again, I figure, well, I thought since I only have one more less, we're going to next week for this series, the letters of John, I'm going to uh, finish up with the third letter of John. So I thought if it's okay, do you want to stay with Wednesday? Does that work? I thought, I said that way I'll save. Uh, Kathy won't have to change the bulletin. So we'll just leave it as Wednesday. And uh, so right now I just have uh, you three and who are all the, we got a, lot, a number of viewers online. So I just want to say those who are, who made it all the way to the end. We're glad that you're watching us on Facebook or watching it recorded. And uh, we hope to see everybody next week. And uh, let's close out with prayer. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for this day. And we thank you for the ability to study your word. Lord, we, uh, we pray that as we go forth from here, that you would uh, bless us uh, with your presence in all things. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Are you yeah, well, um, it's working.